Hey everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to put an IPS screen into a Game Boy Advance. The tools you'll need will vary on if you're buying an aftermarket IPS case or using an original case. If you're using an IPS case, all you need is a try head and a Phillips head screwdriver. If you're using an original case, you're going to need some tools to mark and cut. If you're installing a version 2 screen or you want to have button control with a version 3 screen, you're also going to need a soldering iron. Now I'm installing a version 3 screen, however the version 2 screen is nearly identical with slight changes and I'm going to explain those as I go. Flip your Game Boy over and remove the battery cover. If it even has one, this one didn't. There are 7 screws to remove, 6 try heads and 1 Phillips head. These screws can easily be stripped, so just be careful. I apply some slight downward pressure while I'm unscrewing these and this really seems to help prevent any stripping. With those 7 screws out, the back cover should just pop right off. However, this one was a little stuck so I just had to give it some encouragement. Make sure you move your screws and all the other components to a safe spot so you don't end up losing them. Now that the motherboard is exposed, we're going to remove these 3 Phillips screws to take off the board. Again, just use steady pressure to make sure you don't strip the screws. To remove the screen's ribbon, we're going to gently pop up these two little tabs using a small screwdriver. And then very gently remove the ribbon. Now the good thing is, if you happen to accidentally rip the ribbon cable here, we're replacing the screen anyways. With the ribbon and the screws out, you should be able to remove the motherboard without issue. Now to remove the screen from the front casing. Get a little tool in behind the screen and just gently pop it up. Using a plastic tool will prevent any damage to the case or the screen if you want to save it. Now you should be replacing the screen protector here because the IPS screen is bigger than the original. To remove it, just apply gentle pressure and make sure you don't break the case in half. That would suck. With it completely disassembled, now's the perfect time to give it a very good cleaning. This one was sticky. I took the shield off by removing the four Phillips head screws just so I can make sure I give it the best cleaning I possibly can. Don't forget the buttons because they're usually the worst part. I clean these by using a toothbrush, warm water, and a little bit of dish soap and it does the job pretty well. You can skip this part if you bought an IPS case. Trimming can be the trickiest part, but here's how I do it. On the back of the screen protector, we can see this line that goes all the way around the screen. This line is where the actual window to the screen will be. When I cut a shell with a solid color, I just cut off little bits at a time. And then I pop on the screen protector to see if I've crossed that line. However, with a transparent shell, you can look right through and see where that line is. So just get a sharpie and mark out where you need to cut. I like to cut a couple millimeters past that little line. So there's a variety of tools you can use to cut your shell. I prefer to use a, a Dremel, that's just me, however, but you can use a, a file if you wanted. You can use a knife to like slowly kind of cut away at it. Uh, you can use like clippers or cutters. Um, I don't like that just because I feel like you can crack it. So I just very carefully go at it with a Dremel, but this is entirely your choice. I'll save you folks the video of me cutting it. There's nothing exciting that happens, I promise. Now, because I use a power tool, I build up these little burrs. So I just scrape them down using a file. On to the second part. Do you see this little ridge inside the casing here? We need to completely get rid of that. So you can use a file, sandpaper, or if you're impatient like me, just use a Dremel and get rid of the sucker. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's a transparent case. You're going to see that all the way through it. However, the screen protector is going to go over that and you won't see any of it. Now the disadvantage I have with using my Dremel is that I can't get the ridge in this little corner here. But because it's so small, I can just use a knife and gently file away at it. Now, if you end up doing this, for the love of God, please cut away from you. Another disadvantage with the Dremel is that I get dust everywhere, so I just blow it away with compressed air. Now, I just double check my work here to make sure that that window line is inside my cuts. And I forgot to mention, you need to remove that wall at the start and select button. Really, you should cut all the way up to the directional pad, but I prefer not to. Your screen will come with a double-sided adhesive to stick it into the shell. Now it also comes with braces or you could buy a bracket for the screen itself. However, I found that this adhesive does the job 90% of the time. Install it so the thin sides are at the top and left of the screen. Now this part is optional, but you're going to thank yourself for doing it. Get some packing tape and cover the front of the shell. This will do two things. One, it will prevent dust from falling onto your brand new screen. And two, if dust does get in, it will stick to the tape rather than the screen. Again, not necessary, but you'll thank me later. With the adhesive exposed, we're going to remove the screen protector. I like to do it with the screen facing down so any dust particles don't fall onto your brand new IPS. I've found if you're using an original shell, these screens fit in pretty snug. However, if you have an IPS shell, there's going to be some wiggle room. So if you're getting an IPS shell, I'd also recommend getting the bracket to properly center and fit this. Next, we're going to grab that little piece of paper that says attach this insulating film to the metal surface on the back of the screen. And if you guessed it, we're going to attach this insulating film to the metal surface on the back of the screen. This acts as a barrier to stop it from shorting out once we put on the board. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm doing a version three, which includes this little PCB board. If you're doing a version two, all of these components are gonna be on the ribbon cable. Both the V2 and the V3 use the same screen. They both use the same connector, which takes very little pressure to plug in. If you feel like you have to push hard, it's not seated right. The version three screen has touch color and brightness change. However, you can also add button brightness control with these LR and select pads. Now the version two only has button brightness control and those same pads are gonna be found on the ribbon. I gently soldered the included wires on the L, the R, and the select pads. However, you don't have to do the ground pad. Be very gentle if you're doing this on a V2. The kit comes with two ribbon cables because there's two types of screens. I used my original screen to find out which one I needed and then connected it to the PCB. Connected so the metal pins are facing down. With the version three, we have another piece of insulating film that's just gonna protect the PCB from shorting out on the main board. I should have done this earlier, but I'm gonna test out the screen to ensure that it works. I threw it on my desktop power supply and I flicked it on. Thank God for that because I didn't want to take it all apart. At this point, I put the buttons and the conductive silicone back in because I didn't want to forget them when I put the motherboard back on. Now for the version 3, we have these touch pads, and these things are super finicky. If you touch them with your bare hand, you can easily destroy the adhesive or they fold over on each other and they're basically useless after that. So I took the backing off with a small knife and then pressed it down using a small tool like pliers or the knife itself. If you do accidentally destroy the adhesive, you can use tape to secure them to the shell. So my color change is going to be on top here, and my brightness control is going to be on the bottom. Now when you're putting the motherboard back on, you're going to want to separate or mark these wires so you know which is which. Just going to stop right here for a second. I made a mistake. If you just saw that video there, I put all three wires through the bottom of the case. One of those actually solders to the front of the board, which is going to be just above the select button at the TP2 section. I'll show it. The wire that you have soldered to the select pad on your IPS screen is going to solder to the TP2 spot. With the motherboard back on, I'm going to plug in and secure the ribbon cable to the screen. It's just the reverse of taking it out. We're just going to use a small pen and push these pins in. Solder the wire from the L pad to the inner left post on the left trigger. Then solder the wire from the R pad to the inner left post of the right trigger. Remember, because it's laying on its face, the left trigger is actually going to be on your right and the right trigger is actually going to be on your left. With those wires soldered on, we're done putting in the IPS screen. Reassembly is just the opposite of disassembly. I'm trimming the back shell because I'm actually putting a rechargeable battery pack in this Game Boy. When the back shell is on, return the seven screws. To prevent cross-threading, turn it counterclockwise until you feel a pop or click, and then screw it in. I'm going to leave a link in the description for the screen I use, as well as this rechargeable battery, and just the website I use in general for parts. I just realized in editing this video that I didn't film putting the screen protector on. It, it's just a sticker. Just take off the back and stick it on. That's it. Don't get fingerprints on the back. You'll regret it. And yeah, that's all. Once you have it reassembled, pop in the game and test it out. For the folks with the V3 screen, test the touchpad up top for color change. And the bottom for brightness control. If you included it or you have a V2, hold down select and hit the left and right triggers to test your brightness control. Load up a game and then ensure that every single button works. And if your button brightness control isn't working, ensure that the select and left and right triggers are working. Originally when I installed the screen, the button control didn't work. And after testing, I found that the select button was faulty. Luckily, it just needed a cleaning. And that's how you put an IPS screen into a Game Boy Advance. Now in this Game Boy, I also put Retro 6's rechargeable battery pack, which has USB-C charging. If you want to see how I did that, I'm going to leave a link in the description. So just click on that and follow that tutorial. Now, if you like this video or you found it helpful, please consider liking or subscribing. And if you want to see me do something else or another tutorial, please just leave a comment. So other than that, let's save the consoles. Have a great night.